So you want me to tell you the story of my life? Like I said, that's what I do. I, uh, I interview people. I'm a collector of lives. Welcome to Table Talk. I'm Heath, and I'll be your host. This is the show where I go one-on-one -on -one with a creator, author, illustrator, publisher, or other mover and shaker in the world of tabletop games, video games, TV, movies, or any other area of the geekverse. You followed me here, didn't you? Yeah, I suppose I did. You seem very interesting. This is where you live? Yes, this is my home. Welcome. So, what do you do? I'm a vampire. That's something I haven't heard before. Guests have included individuals such as Lou Anders, the author of the Thrones and Bones fantasy novels, creator and publisher of the Norengard RPG, and even the author of Star Wars, A Pirate's Price. Bond. James Bond. Well, not James Bond. I haven't gotten to talk to him yet, but maybe sometime in the future. But how about Brian Cullen, the creator of the vast, grim, dark horror RPG and sculptor of the world of Revelo monster busts? Mark Tassin, the creator of the world of Ataltus, head of Mechanical Muse, and the head developer of the new cool name RPG. I've spoken with Jeff Inglestein, game designer and former commentator on the Dice Tower. He and I got deep into the statistics, probability, and psychological function of dice in tabletop games. Jamie Stegmeyer, the founder of Stonemeyer Games and crowdfunder extraordinaire. He's published many hit board games like Scythe and Wingspan. I've spoken with Sidney Inglestein from Indie Boards and Cards to talk about what it really takes to publish a board game in today's environment and what it would take for you to get published if you were trying to get a publisher for your board game. I've spoken with Ajit George about game writing, education, and his contribution to Van Richter's Guide to Ravenloft and his development of the journey through the Radiant Citadel Dungeons and Dragons book. Uh, let's see, who else have I spoken to? I am Hela, Odin's firstborn, commander of the legions of Asgard the rightful heir to the throne, and the goddess of death. Ah, yes, I really appreciate her taking the time to speak with me. That was a great interview. I've also spoken with Cameron Pasha, a writer and novelist who's been working in Hollywood for over 20 years. His projects have included Emmy and Golden Globe-nominated Sleeper Cell, Kings, Nikita, and Roswell, New Mexico. His analysis and commentary have been very popular on YouTube. I've gotten to speak with Paul Shadow, the former network executive who has made quite a splash here on YouTube with his reaction videos to current movies and films. He and I discussed the status of independent film and web productions online today. Brianna De Silva is a reoccurring guest on the show and a very popular one at that. She's an author and director and she was also the co-writer of the cultist comedy web show that's here on the channel. She and I regularly meet to study and analyze stories. I've also gotten to speak with of the Positive Fandom channel. She's an ally in our effort to be a positive and constructive force in the Geekverse. Are you ready? Have you got your drink? Are you all settled in? You might want to buckle up because it could be a wild ride. We're about to explore the worlds of tabletop gaming, sci-fi, fantasy, and the Geekverse through the eyes of those who are making things happen. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Roger, ready to move out. It's time for Table Talk. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the office. Welcome to Table Talk. This is going to be, I think, an absolutely excellent episode. And you know, I was just thinking, I meant to say this last time and I forgot. I need to update the intro here because I had just made that intro right before Doug started regularly appearing on the channel. So I really need to put Doug in the intro because I know he is a favorite for everyone. So tonight we're going to be talking about Moana from two different perspectives. The perspective of it being a hero's journey uh, story, as well as from Doug's perspective of his theory of the heroine's labyrinth that we've got. I think this will be a really interesting discussion. I think this will be fantastic. So in order to have that discussion, we have two guests tonight. First, we have Doug, regular hey. on the panel. <laughs> But then also, actually, the guy who introduced me to Moana, uh, Lou Anders, hey. is here as well. So he is going to be talking about uh, Moana uh, in the context of the hero's journey and as, as Star Wars as well. Uh, we want to introduce ourselves. I'll let you guys introduce yourselves briefly before uh, we get started. Yes, I know. Doug Tom Grant says Doug is almost a cornerstone here. Yeah, I know. He's actually, I think he's eclipsed Brianna on the number of episodes he's been on now. So he definitely. Really? <laughs> so, wow. yes. Uh, all right. So, uh, Doug, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Doug Burton. Like most people and... know you, as they're just saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the author of Far Away Bird, uh, it's a historical fiction novel. 
about Byzantine Empress Theodora. I used uh, the hero's journey to help me start it. And um, I struggled to use the hero's journey for a large swath, including the middle and end. And uh, that led me to do a whole bunch of research on heroines, which is the basis. All those notes became the basis of the book that's upcoming called The Heroine's Labyrinth, an alternative to the hero's journey, which, by the way, um, does not have it. It's it still has high regard and high respect for the hero's journey. It's not meant as a replacement. It's meant as a compliment uh, to the hero's journey. So I just put the link to Faraway Bird in the uh, in the chat. And, you know, actually, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to drop a link to it in the Discord server. I'll put a link to the Discord server in here. So if you are on the Table Talk channel in the Discord server, and that way you can find them easily, these links easily as well. If you're there, you don't have to see them scrolling by on uh, uh, on the YouTube chat. So the Discord server link is there. Far Away Bird just got dropped here and there. Uh, yes, and the Heroine's Labyrinth, we've been over quite a bit here. Uh, Lou. Lou, you want to introduce yourself and also talk about what you are doing right now, because I have the link to your Kickstarter. Oh, thank you very much. Here I am Lou Anders. Uh, I am a former science fiction and fantasy editor. I spent 15 years editing science fiction, fantasy books and short stories. I then, uh, in 2014, I started publishing children's novels. I have four original children's novels and a Star Wars novel out. Then when the pandemic hit, I took that as the chance to do something I've always wanted to do. And I created a fifth edition powered campaign setting for uh, the land of Norengard, which is the Norse flavored land of my very first novel, and uh, expanded that into a campaign setting and a, a, a companion adventure book, a, a, another adventure book. And there are already uh, just just in the last few years, there's a soundtrack mm -hmm. by a Grammy nominated composer. Mm -hmm. There's um hundreds of uh, VTT battle maps from our partners at Heroic Maps. There are uh, Milestone Heroes that makes 3D tabletop terrain, has made tons of 3D printed terrain to match the adventures in the book so you can print them out and play through them that way. Um, and then the latest project, which Heath is showing, is uh, I've kind of put my editor hat back on for the first time in in almost a decade and we're coming out with tales from stolke's hall which are 10 adult fantasy fiction short stories not children's set in the same land of norengard and there's a, a ebook version and a trade hardcover version and then a deluxe gamer version which will be sized like the role-playing game manuals and with full color uh ksenia kozhevnikova who i love is doing a chapter illustration for each chapter and there's additional art and then there'll be an appendices at the back of 5e mechanics that um, allow you to take elements from the writer's stories and put them into your games. And this oh, is an yeah, active uh, Kickstarter? <laughs> this is on Kickstarter right now. And then um, I'm also migrating away from 5th edition to Cobalt Press's Tales of the Valiant. And so I'm also in their Kickstarter right now as one of the add-on uh publishing partner packs we've been following tales of the valiant here on morning grind i'm doing a short adventure for them as well i need to make sure in, I call again them. in in my world wow that's oh, very okay. so it's actually always oh, expanding your world you're not it's for them but i mean it's, it's in their in their it's kickstarter in their world system, it's in, your it's, world. It's, it's it's in my world. world and and oh, well, it's 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 interesting because they came to me to do this and I'm planning on leaving the Norse land and going into uh, other countries with my next big effort. And that's when I was planning on doing the, the system switch as well. And when they came and asked me to do this, um, I'm not ready to make the jump out of the country yet. So I'm doing something on the border of Norengard and the neighboring country of Ireland which will hint at what's going to be happening to the South in the big adventure when I get there. So it's kind of a, a prequel. Well, it will be a standalone adventure in its own right, but it will Luke, hint at what to come. I know some of us have seen Lou because you were on the channel during the OGL debacle. People have also seen you. You were actually my very first Table Talk guest, Lou. Mm -hmm. And I saw we did a replay of your episode on one of the episodes of the Crafter's Corner. Everybody really appreciated all of your insight. Because like I said, this Lou's got Lou's had it all. He's had wow. the, the 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 traditional publishing deals, he's had the licensed publishing deals, he's done self-publishing through the RPG. He's done all of those things, and in his own world, he has what all so many of us want, 
all of us here are probably <laughs> some of us want the stories, the RPG, the games, the soundtracks. He's he's got it all. So Lou has gotten uh, has had tremendous success in that. That's the dream right there. <laughs> it is. Uh, and then also, I guess I will say finally that I am also on Kickstarter right now. We got like forty eight hours left. We're going to be right here. This is the Good Night Sword Kickstarter that uh, I am running right here. Good Night Sword is the very first story that is in one of the worlds that I have created. This is Good Night Sword. It is obviously a takeoff on Good Night Moon, a world of gallantry, chivalry, and rabbits based on the classic story, Good Night Moon. So if you know someone who is of Good Night Moon age, children, nieces, nephews, younger cousins, children of friends who you would like to get interested in fantasy and um, uh, fantasy and medieval tales, well, Good Night Sword is the place for that uh, because, you know, there's, they've got to be geeks who want to read their kids Good Night Sword, right? So Good Night Sword is now on Kickstarter. I wrote it. Adam Botsford illustrated it. Uh, we have, uh, and also, actually, if you lo if you check out that page here, there is an animated audio book, again, illustrated by Adam Botsford, read or narrated and animated by Brianna De Silva. So, hey, yes, the on the Kickstarter is the digital edition and also a hardback book edition which i'm very proud of the proof is already here here is the proof right here so it awesome. is ready to go um so that you can get on the kickstarter and it's only available on the kickstarter i'm not stocking additional uh additional books but also if you want tonight to have uh children be uh uh to experience this you can go right here it's the animated audiobook and it's embedded right here it's the entire book animated uh as an audiobook right here and you can listen in awesome all right heath Let's i have on. backed your project and lou i made a note here i'm gonna go on and uh, back <laughs> your you. kickstarter as well and anyone in the chat or anyone watching the video i i always strongly encourage backing up independent projects from creative people um you know the mainstream sometimes is is very monolithic sometimes you get what you want sometimes you don't but independent creatives go out there and, and make something new and unique and original. So uh, I just strongly encourage, even if it's $20 or, or $10 or whatever it is to get on and, and back uh, these Kickstarter projects. Yes. And, uh, and that's why that's part of what this channel is. You know, I say that yeah. uh, we're a constructive channel. We're focused on creating things that we want to exist. So yeah. that's what we cover a lot of creatives and things like that here. For if you're unhappy with mainstream media for whatever reason, well, <laughs> this channel covers all of the independents. And it's easy to be uh, not happy with mainstream. Uh, Even if it's only a dollar, right? Yeah, get you get in and follow. That way, you're following somebody. Even if it's just a dollar right now. Yeah, anything. Back, back, put in the dollar. You'll get the updates and start following what somebody is doing. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and you get to be a part of it. You know. Oh, now, Sable Phoenix says, I put in $9 to get Heath's. Thank you very much, Sable Phoenix. And now I am at around 50. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right. Okay. So let's get to the topic because I know we don't have Lou for very for all that long tonight. So let's get into this. This is Moana. I watched it again just before we started here. I do love this movie. Some it's people are, are maybe, you know, this is this is the movie that the first movie we talked about that isn't like horror, you know, on table talk, isn't horror, <laughs> things, you know, you know, blood going everywhere, whatever. <laughs> I mean, this it's not, but I think, I think this movie is one of the ones that proves, I would have to put this very high on one of my favorite movie lists because of what it does. It does, it's structured extremely well. It, I think it's a, a, a great story. This one has to rank highly. It's doing what it's supposed to do which so many movies sometimes don't today. This one is. And so we want to talk about it in terms of story structure. Uh, Lou, do you want to lead off? Since, why don't you lead us off? Well, okay. It, um, I want to, I don't, I want to know how, to, how I should jump in because it, I love Moana. Uh, I, it's, it's funny. There are a couple things that my wife can't watch because she passes out every time. <laughs> and uh, one of them is the Dark Crystal, which is really dear to me. And every time I try and show her the Dark Crystal, she just <sighs> falls asleep <sighs> about five minutes in. And so I've given up on that. And we've tried twice to show her Moana. And around about the time they start singing about all the things they have on the island, how they got everything they need on the island, oh, she down. starts snoring. I don't know why. Oh, no. I can't even, I've played that song in the car, and she's falling asleep. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's you conditioned her. <laughs> it's a, yes, it's a film that divides my family. But um, 
I am, uh, I guess, a, a little bit of a background. I, I spent five years out in Hollywood in the 90s as a journalist hanging out on, on mostly mostly Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Star Trek Voyager, and Babylon 5. And uh, while I was out there, I started writing scripts with a partner. And um, we never had anything made, but we had stuff optioned. And during that time, I basically apprenticed to a screenwriting guru named Dan Decker. And uh, he was working out his own ideas about Hollywood. And I started uh, uh, taking all his courses and, and then just became friends with Dan. And, and he would workshop stuff on me. And, and, uh, and it wasn't exactly Hero's Journey. Dan had, a, had, a, had a, a way of breaking down story that he felt like. Because sometimes I think that, um, that Hero's Journey can be a bit like slaloming down a hill on skis and you feel like oh we've had our inciting incident now we've got to have the you know the and you, you're trying to push your story to make the signposts whether <laughs> it wants to naturally or not and so dan came up with a theory of 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 story that that hits a lot of the same points but does so primarily from the interaction of character and uh and I used that when I wrote back then. Then I left Hollywood. I became an editor and I spent years editing and I didn't think about it. And then I was in uh, the World Science Fiction Convention in Denver. This is probably 15 years ago and uh, or more. And I was sitting around in a hotel room with uh, Mary Robinette Kowal and Paolo Bacigalupi, two tremendous writers. And they started asking me about my time in Hollywood. And so I said, well, if you want to explain the the, the formula f to you and I did and both of their eyes popped open and Paolo said I'm doing a lot of that I don't know I'm doing it <laughs> and Mary Robinette said I'm not doing it and you just fixed the end of my novel and uh, she made a tweak based on the recommendation she said she had given um, she had given Tommy Kratz says what's Babylon 5 ha ha <laughs> 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 she had she had um, given her novel to like five beta readers and they'd all gotten to the end and thought, eh. And then she made this one change, which I, I can talk about later and given it back to them. And they read the exact same novel again. And all five of them burst into tears when they hit the ending. And That's a pretty uh, big difference. Yes. And when I heard that, I'm like, there's something here. So I started teaching plotting to novelists, not not screenwriters because i've never i don't have a movie i can point to i can't say come see my film so i don't feel like i have a right to teach screenwriting but i have uh helped people plot their novels by teaching my novel plot story hmm. and um that went on for a few years until i i read a book i because i think most writing books are trash uh, <laughs> I think that most of them are are just you know feel your inner writer and i don't know have a do yoga in the morning and write what you want and, and and i they're not practical and i've only read two that i thought were worth uh crap one was um my story will beat up your story by jeffrey allen Schechter. Mm. and oh, i haven't uh, heard of that one and yeah i usually don't tell it because it's my secret weapon oh, but yeah. uh <laughs> well then let me write this down <laughs> yeah my story can beat up your story my story can beat up your story and it's 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 um it, he's he's a very prolific writer of television and film, and um, it's not the most eloquently written book. Some of the examples are probably dated, but it's uh, it's brilliant in, in in some of the ways it tackles story. I haven't read King's on, on writing is wonderful. The only King I've ever read is It. I, I see this in the comments. And it oh, was yeah. I read like uh, you know over a thousand pages of It to find out that it's really hard to grow up and people are mean to each other, and that was <laughs> kind of it for me and Stephen King. But um, not that I don't respect him. But uh, and then more recently, Matt Bird's um, The Secrets of Story. I, I agree. I love that. That's yeah, one of the ones that I love too. Brilliant book. An absolutely brilliant book. But um, but I guess do you want me to take you through it? Is that my monopolizing here to take to, to, through your story structure? Yeah. I want to have you specifically to talk about that. If we need to talk about it with regard to Moana, I want to have you on specifically to go through your story structure. Okay. Well, I. Or, no, yeah. but, but tell what we need to know. Tell what we need to know. I mean, time, time is yours. Well, I mean, 
but I do, I do what I, I want. I would love to have you back for the the Dark Knight, and I would also love <laughs> to have you specifically talk about your particular story structure. Right. But that, if you give an overview here, maybe later we can dive in deep. Tell what it, you it, tell what you want it, to know. Tell what you, you need have to, to talk about it to analyze the Dark Knight. I don't know what we have to talk about to analyze um, Moana. Doug, if you don't mind, I can do this or or no, I don't mind at all. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm so all ears. basically all stories boil down to a triangle of three characters. And it's the protagonist, the antagonist, and what they used to call the dynamic or relationship character. And you could call it the mentor, but sometimes it's the mentor is a different role. So I, I don't I tend to avoid calling it the mentor. But the protagonist is somebody who wants something desperately and can't have it. And the more they want it and the further they are from it, the, the, the more we connect to them. You know, um, Harry Potter wants a family. So he lives under the stairs with, you know, he's the puppy dog outside the window looking through the glass at the world's worst family that excludes him. Um, what your character wants and then... The antagonist is not the bad guy of the film. The antagonist is the person who is placing the most obstacles in the protagonist's path. So, for instance, Thelma and Louise, does anybody remember that? Vaguely. Or, yeah. I mean, I, I, I watched it semi-recently. Well, I mean, Thelma and Louise, they're, they're, they're you know, you know they, they, they're, they're running. And what they want is to drive off the cliff. And the person that's stopping them is Harvey Keitel, the sheriff. He's the only decent man in a movie full of horrendous males. And he gets who they are and he gets where they're headed and he gives them every opportunity to save their lives. And because they don't want their lives saved, spoiler, he's <laughs> the antagonist of that film. So literally the, the nicest male in that film, arguably the nicest person, is our antagonist. You know, uh, Casablanca? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What does Rick want? To be left alone, right? Oh, to, no, no, no. Like, disappear. Really What's that? What does he really want? Oh, his unconscious conviction? No, no. Simplify it. What does he want? Who a does woman. he want? A woman. <laughs> Elsa. He wants Elsa. Yeah. Right. So who's the antagonist of that film? Oh, man. The, what's the name? Uh, uh, the police inspector? No, no. No, oh, no, oh, oh. Nope, no. Nope. The police inspector has another role. Um, we'll talk about that. The, 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 most people think it's Major Strasse, the Nazi, because the Nazi has to be the bad guy, right? <laughs> but, but the Nazi is a villain. See, right. So yeah, people are, uh, but, but the Nazi right. is not, I mean, the Nazi tells Rick at like the three quarter mark of the film, help me trap the husband. I'll take him off to prison and I'll leave you the girl. The Nazi is facilitating what Rick wants. The Nazi is, while he's a Nazi and he's a horrible person, he is not the antagonist because he's perfectly happy to let Rick go off with Elsa as long as he gets her husband. And Sable Phoenix has it. The husband is the is the antagonist. Yeah. What was his name again? Um, I knew it until you asked. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been sitting here drawing a blank on it. It's, it's not Victor Laszlo, is it? Victor Laszlo. Laszlo. That sounds right. It. OK, so That's Laszlo. Good. Laszlo has walked out of two, not one, but two Nazi prisons. He's escaped from two Nazi prisons. We're told that he is essential to us winning the war, to the Allies winning the war. He walks into Rick's Cafe, which is full of the most disaffected people on earth at the time. And within five minutes, he has them singing the Austrian national anthem, right? Or the French national anthem, French or whatever national, it is. Yeah. French national anthem. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's cause the right, divided France. He's, he is the greatest person on earth. And he even says to Elsa, were you lonely when I was in prison? I is telling her, I'll forgive you if you if you had sex with somebody when I was in prison because you didn't know I was wasn't dead. You know, he's the he's the most he's the most forgiving husband in the world. <laughs> he's a hero of all of all of Europe. He's the most motivating, inspiring person. He is our antagonist because he is going to take Elsa away. And that's that's how it works. Then finally, you have the relationship character. Wait, I, want, I want to say I want to say yes. I'm sorry. I I put that up, James. Sorry, but you're right. It was I I read too quickly. But you're right. What we're trying to say is the opposite of what you originally put up. That 
not all not all villains are antagonists. The antagonist does not have to be a villain. Uh, yeah, and I'm inclined to agree with that. I I have I always had a problem with the word antagonist because for villains, because a villain is not someone who simply antagonizes the lead character. I mean, it, the villain is a codified version of, of of a way of life that's completely incompatible. So an antagonist, yeah, I, I've, that never sat right with me. So it's interesting yeah. hearing in you our story kind of analysis. Of we have to separate those. Yeah, yeah. The the villains and antagonists. Sometimes those are the, those the same. Sometimes they are not. I love that. So the last character is the relationship character. And in every single movie, there is a point called the do you know what your problem is point. Where the lead character's companion says to them, do you know what your problem is? And the hero always says, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. I'm not listening. And they refuse to acknowledge what's wrong with them. And they can't succeed at the end of the film until they take their fingers out of their ears and listen. So in Casablanca, that's Louis Renault, the inspector. The inspector says to him, Rick, you have the letters of transit. I think you're still a patriot. I think you're still in the fight. Rick says, I stick my neck out for no one and nobody. Right. And Major Strasser right. says, no, I think you have a heart. You know, because Strasser was trying to cheat at cards, so the girl, I mean, no, no, Strasser was trying to force the girl who wanted to get her husband out to sleep with him for an exit visa. And Rick goes in and leans on the table so the guy wins it at cards and can pay for the visa and the girl doesn't have to sleep with Strasser. I mean, with a, a, a Renault. And Renault is furious. And, uh, but he says to him, like, you have a heart, Rick. Yeah, that was, that was, that was sentimentalism. And Rick says, no, I don't. And they put a bet on it. They bet money that Rick doesn't have a heart. I mean, that's right there. And at the end of the film, Rick joins the fight, shoots the Nazi, tells Elsa to get on the plane with her husband and, and says, Louis, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. That's the moment when he acknowledges that, that he is still in the fight, that he still cares. Um, I have to. I have to. Sable Phoenix, you're right. You have to. I know. I know. I when I saw that, that's why I pulled right. Up. It's the greatest. She says the Joker tries to say, "Do you know what your problem is?" Conversation with Batman. Yes, it's the greatest. Do you know what your problem is? Uh, we're doing it. I'm sorry. We're doing Dark Knight. Um, <laughs> it, yeah. The, the 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 antagonist of the film is not the Joker. The conversation in the jail cell where the Joker says, "Don't act like them. You're not like them. Even if you want to be, you're a freak like me." is that do you know what your problem is? And Batman is the has the greatest I am not listening response. He beats the shit. <laughs> he beats him up. <laughs> he just keeps slamming him on the table and body slamming him and crashing him into the wall, saying, shut up, shut up. And the Joker is like, you're not, you're not getting it. And the Joker tells three jokes in the in the in the movie. Do you know how I got these scars? Do you know how I get the scars? And when he tells the third joke, Batman says, no, but I know how you're gonna get these and shoots him in the face. And the Joker's delighted because Batman has just done something really dark. Yeah. And says, now, you know, I'll go get Two Face. I'll be here when you get back. Uh, we're going to have such fun together. The Batman acknowledging that he is the bad guy, tell them I did it, is the journey that the Joker's taking him on in that movie. Two Face is the, is the one placing the obstacles. So, Zero the Blade is asking, what does this have to do with Moana? But what we were doing Whoa. here, we were trying to, we were establishing Lou's story structure. Yes which is about to be used for Moana. So, now, I love we Moana. Know where we need to go, but that's uh, that's what we are doing here. So, so I loved Moana. I came out of Moana. I was wondering why I loved Moana, and I realized <laughs> Moana is a structural retelling point for point of another film. I identical so you have a young person. They live in a rural environment. They really, 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 really want to board a craft and leave. And their parental figure says, no, stay here and farm. The young person has a special connection to a force of nature. The water. 
than a dark force, which we'll later find out is the opposite of the is, is, is a corruption of a light force encroaches and they have to leave and they look for a pilot who will navigate them but the pilot is a jerk <laughs> <laughs> without a heart arrogant <laughs> and they have to convince the pilot to go on the journey at the end the pilot says screw that i'm not going they realize they have to do it. They have to deliver the payload on their own. They're there to fire that magic stone at the dark force. When the pilot returns in the form of a falcon. <laughs> the falcon, right? Yeah. yeah. And he buys them enough time to deliver the payload to blow up the Death Star restore the goddess. You know, what's funny is I saw the way through the film. Sorry. Their dead mentor returns as a force ghost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just put them back on the right track. You know, it's funny is I saw, I saw so Heath. So that's why this is Star Wars. Yeah, yeah it's that. Star Wars. It's I saw movie. Heath's thumbnail title that says Ismo on a Star Wars. Yeah. So when I, I was you. watching it, the part that I laughed at is, Maui as the Falcon literally is like, yeah, when he comes in at the end. Yes. <laughs> it's completely Star Wars. And it, 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 in fact, in the original drafts, the pig and the rooster were going to be on the boat with her. And then they realized oh. there was too many characters and they, and they left the pig at home. That's why the pig stays on the dock. Mm. But the pig and the rooster, I think were originally conceived as C-3PO and R2-D2 <laughs> with, with the rooster being the, the, the one who's constantly going, oh my, you know, where am I? What is this? I hate this. Get me out of here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. It's funny. I, uh, as I watched, I was conscious of, of the, that header. So I was looking for some of the, the overlaps and I was able to catch, uh, I didn't catch all the, all of the things you just mentioned, but I did catch some of them. Um, especially the, um, the force ghost of the grandma, which is the return of the wise guide. That's pretty, uh, that's, you know, a common archetype that happens, but very prominently in star Wars. Oh, and there's even stuff when you start looking for it, like midway to halfway point in Star Wars. I think it's a halfway point. They, um, you know, they, they Princess Leia has to get them out of a trap. So they blast a hole in the in the air vent and they jump in and they end up in a trash compactor. Where they're almost crushed. Shiny. They oh, in the uh, they realm jumped of out a hole <laughs> where the giant crab in a pile of gunk, in a pile of stuff. <laughs> He's in a pile of basically garbage. Yeah, yeah. You're... I mean, it's gold, but it's 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 a big pile of of of, of refuse at the bottom of the ocean, <laughs> and almost crushes them. Yeah. Now, Sable Phoenix says, but Luke doesn't return to Tatooine at the end of the movie as Moana does. But what I was noticing is that they both end up in celebration. Yeah. At the end, the end of the movie, both of those cases are celebration. Luke gets his celebration when when she's what what it ends up with Moana is celebration as well. Well, I will, and I'll, uh, at some point, I'll get to some of the nuances for the Heroine's Labyrinth, which addresses some of the, and what's interesting is it's not even refuting um, what Lou's talking about, um, because there's clearly some Hero's Journey tropes there, and it is interesting to overlap it with Star Wars, which is so, such a universal reference for story. Um, I had not caught the Falcon. I love that. I'll, I'll never be able to watch Moana now. Yeah, it's it's. Without noticing the falcon, like, that's the falcon. <laughs> well, and that's such an iconic part of the hero's journey. The help, the help unlooked for. It's, it's actually my favorite part of the hero's journey. But, when when the hero is is and needs a little bit of help, and if you've done it right, you've forgotten about who can help the hero. And in Moana, the demigod guy comes flying in. Yes, but and in the in Star Wars, Han Solo comes flying in on the falcon yep, at just the right partners. moment. And it, it, you know, it, it, when I started tugging at the threads was when I was like, it's interesting that Moana has this special connection to water, that the water chooses her, the water interacts with her. And I was thinking about that. And that's when I realized, oh, my God, it's the force. It's, <laughs> it's the force. And what is what's happened to what is her name? Natifi, uh, the, the goddess. Teka or Tefiti. Yeah. Yeah. She's she's just the corrupt, the dark side of the force. 
Yeah, that that's awesome. I Moana was interesting to me because it seems to have a lot of the tropes of the hero's journey, like clear market mm -hmm. archetypal tropes there. Um, and it also follows a lot of the model that I had set aside as a heroine story. And um, some of the some one of the movies I studied was Moana. Um, you know, some movies do a little bit of both. They borrow from a little bit of both sides of it. And the one thing about the heroines labyrinth, that's a, a big thing, is the native culture. So I think Sable Phoenix mentions how um, Moana returns to the native culture and how the there is an atonement between Moana and the native culture. That is something very typical of heroine centric stories um, where the where there's a conflict between the heroine and her native culture and it usually comes from what I call the, the claiming of the sacred fire, where the heroine claims her sacred fire one way, but the native culture claims it in another. And the native culture's claim is almost, I think the word I've, I've zeroed, in, zeroed in on is continuity. There's something that the native culture wants from the heroine in terms of continuity. And there's something the heroine wants uh, in terms of individual agency, individual free will that she claims early in the, in the story uh, and Moana clearly does that with that musical number, How Far I'll Go. That's yeah. her claiming her sacred fire. She's She's got something that's um, that she wants to do that the native culture is like, well, <laughs> no. In fact, in the in the musical number for the native culture, which is, I think, the opening number, the native culture lays out their expectations. You know, um, you know, we, we hunt, we gather. Uh, this is where we sit. And, and there's even a line that's like, um, and we never leave. <laughs> I always laugh now when I hear it, it's like, and no one leaves. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, That's a little creepy. <laughs> uh, no one ever leaves here. But um, but the point is that the reason that lyric is in the song is because it's pointing out we don't go beyond the breakers. You know, this is our home. We settled here. This is where we stay. Uh, you know, they're like, that's right. We stay. That, that's the whole message. So that that's that conflict between the, the the claiming of the sacred fire between the heroine and the native culture. Except they don't stay. The final shot is her on the boat. She's transformed them from a from from yes. farmers to to now to space explorers to seafarers. Well, There's yes. a um uh, zero the blade says they so they 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 took a Disney yeah, right. re, took Star Wars and redid it to fit a culture. There's uh something in, in real life history the Maori people migrated uh, for hundreds if not I think thousands of years. And then they stopped for 1,000 years. Oh. And then they began migrating again. And Moana was written to explain what made them migrate again. So See, I love that. Historically, it really, they stopped for 1,000 years, and then they started migrating once more. That's and pretty so, fascinating, because yeah. that's a, those are cultural, that's archetype, that's a cultural archetype. Yep. Unique, it sounds like, uh, to a, a Polynesian, or you said Maori culture. So that's that's a cultural archetype that's now built into this story, yep. which which I think is awesome. So the end of the hero heroine's labyrinth usually there's a strong feature between the atonement between what the heroine wants, her claiming of the sacred fire, which is to be a seafaring person and explorer, and the native culture, which is we stay put. There's a there's a scene early on where her father who. I, I think they avoid using the word princess in this. I think they call her the daughter of the chief, which mm -hmm. she, she rejects being called a princess. Well, right. Yeah, she's, she's called a princess. And the, the Ma Maui says, you know, feisty young daughter of the chief, female, I mean, animal companion. Same difference, yeah. right. Yeah. Animal yeah. companion, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so the, but the dad takes Moana up to the top of the mountain. And it's, I think it's called the place of chiefs. And there's like this, this cairn, this like stack of stones. Yeah. And he's like, Every person before you stacks a stone, one day you'll stack your stone. That That is a clear continuity message built in, into Moana. And he's like, you will stack your stone here. And what's interesting is, now, I don't believe there's a perfect maze, in, a labyrinth in Moana. I do think it follows more of the hero's journey in the sense that she leaves. She has to break a threshold to go out beyond. However... I did notice what I would call a maze-like symbolism with her symbol. I think her symbol is the conch shell. And I noticed early on that the conch shells stack up almost like breadcrumbs, which you would find in a maze. And it leads her out to sea. Um, and at the end of the story, that conch shell is what she stacks on top of the stones. Mm -hmm. So what she does is she, 
she gets what she wants, which is to be an explorer. And what she and the way this is reconciled with her native culture is that she changes the native culture to become once again a seafaring nation, a seafaring people. And I love that reconciliation of the that, that's a great atonement uh, in terms of the heroine and the native culture, which there was a rub. And by the end of the story, that 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 tension is resolved and it's resolved beautifully. And, and it's resolved in a way that's completely believable. And, and now I didn't even know, Lou, that it's resolved in a historic sense uh, as well, that this this followed a model of, of a seafaring island uh, dwelling yeah. nation. That's amazing. Disney worked with, I think it was 100 cultural uh, advisors and experts to, to, to get it right. Wow. Yeah. I, I, th I am not an expert, but as a, a someone watching, it felt authentic. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought it was great. I mean, when the, I'm not even a, a song guy, but I love the songs in Moana. They're they're like I, I know, me well too. Written. I know this, this is I always pay attention when I'm watching movies. When you come across a movie that ordinarily I wouldn't watch, <laughs> like it, you know, it's part of some genre that I'm generally not interested in. It's not you know whatever. But then sometimes you come across a movie like this is an animated, you know more children's oriented film. This is ordinarily not one that I would watch. It's, but then Lou actually said, like, we got to watch this. And I was like, now it's become one of my favorite movies. So this is an iconic movie to me because it's outside of what I normally watch. Wizards and Knights, you know, and you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> Star Trek. but yet this one is so awesome. So I always pay special attention when I find a movie like this, that's outside of my typical genre that is so awesome. And so okay. I to on that, I have to make a quick recommendation, which I'm only two episodes in, but I am loving American born Chinese. Uh, <laughs> oh, I heard, I heard I about was that. Watching it just cause we're a, we're a half Asian family here and I wanted to support, but I was expecting it to be, you know, sillier, doofier, more like a Disney sitcom from the old days. And it's not, it's more like it's slotting in at, at, toward the top. It's not MCU, but it feels like when MCU is really good, it's it take it almost feels like Spider Man to me. It's taking oh, wow. it to establish the characters. It's really nuanced. Um, the 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 world is really well developed. I, I I don't know. If, I've only I've only watched two episodes. I don't know if it sustains, but those first two episodes are fire. I'm loving it. So huge shout out, Heath, American born Chinese. American born Chinese. Okay, I I was yep. I don't know anything about that. I haven't even heard. Based of on a graphic heard. novel. It's on it's on uh, Disney Plus right now. It has Michelle Yao in it. So. You know. Oh, I love Michelle Yao. Yep. So okay, so, look, Yao, so let sorry. me say when when Zero the Blade said so Lucas took a bedtime story. Our our level of analysis here is that Lucas didn't take a, a bedtime story. He he's told an ar very archetypical story. Mm -hmm. he, Sounds he, like he, he took told a... the archetypical story extremely well. With and actually, strong... you know, sometime we should go through Star Wars, the original Star Wars, on this and talk about exactly why it is so archetypical. So I wouldn't have said no. It's it's a bedtime story. Right. So my thing is, if a movie is really excellent, my question is why? Like, what makes, why am I interested in this? What is hooking me? And likewise, if something's really bad, like The Last Jedi or something, I'm just like, okay, so what's what's turning me off? Like, what what's not working? And usually my one answer is when I can unpack a movie and there's just more and more and more and more when I'm unpacking it and it never gets, there seems to be no end to it. I know that the author, either consciously or unconsciously, was was thinking in archetypal terms and, and tapped into that. Versus a movie that's not working, the more you unpack it, the less it makes sense. The more the story falls apart, uh, the more the plots don't add up, and it seems like they all just they start to collapse. Moana is one of those that the more I unpack it, the more I enjoy the movie because it, it holds up across the spectrum as as I dig into it. So let, let me ask this question. About, we're still at the beginning of the movie, but I think this is an interesting point that goes to heroine's labyrinth versus hero's journey. Because okay, I'm sorry? I, I wouldn't say versus. Okay, I think versus. I think they complement each other very well in this story. Okay. 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 Be, okay. Then here's here's a point where we may have this 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 we've got her, and Lou was talking about her place on the island 
as analogous to Luke on the farm. Okay, so that's very hero's journey like. Here's the distinction. Okay, okay so no, so but, but you are using this as her in conflict with culture because Luke is also kind of in conflict with his culture. Now it's a very small culture because it's very. But you were talking about. So what is it that you're that you're picking up on there that's saying this is heroine's journey life? So well, it's a little bit. It's a little bit of both because she leaves that island. However, usually in hero, sent in in warrior oriented or hero journey stories, the native culture's claim on the hero is for their labor. In heroine stories, it's for some form of continuity. They want her to perpetuate something in the native culture. Uh -huh. Luke isn't asked to perpetuate anything. He is there for his labor. I need you. Um, I need you on the farm. I need you for two more seasons. You know, make sure the the droids are uh, cleaned up. You know, you, you can waste time with your friends later. You've got chores to do. You know, there's there's a claim on the hero's labor. Uh, there's there's not so much of a claim on labor to Moana as there is for something co for continuity. It is continuity. So right. However, I'm they're closely related. So I, I, would, I wouldn't say that they're strikingly different. I would say that is a nuance different in terms of what the native culture is asking of the heroine versus the hero. Although it feels very similar in both sets. That's fascinating. I, right. I'm, I'm fast. I have to process this because I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about another Disney franchise, which is Frozen. Where the claim on Elsa, although she's not the lead, is that she needs to con she needs to inherit the crown. Yes. Birthright but, is a common but, one. Something for continuity. Yep. Um, where like in, in the Matrix with Neo, he's like, you shape up or you get yourself another job. You know, right. his claim is labor. Again, and even when he's captured, Agent Smith is like one of these Neos has a future as a computer or a software designer. The other future doesn't, you know. So there's usually a claim on the hero's labor. But for heroines, there tends to be something that they want her to perpetuate. And for Prince, so anyway, but it is it is similar in that there's some friction with the native culture for both the hero and the heroine. But now... Now, this actually this comes back to what Sable Phoenix is. You're saying that in generally in heroine stories, she's in conflict with her native culture, and that the goal is ultimately to fix it, which Moana does. So yes, so, and Luke does not. Right, Luke never returns to fix what's wrong with Tatooine. So in the right. hero's journey, usually the Luke claim on the hero's labor. Is so right for the hero's Luke. journey, the claim on the hero's labor is usually interrupted by the call to adventure and the hero leaves the native culture to go do something that helps the native culture right. in a different way. His labor was like menial, <laughs> you know, and, and that's why the hero aspires to something else. He, he's better than menial work. For Moana, the atonement with the native culture is, is important to hero and centric story. So she does come back and, and that is resolved. Luckily, she resolves it in, in, in the most beautiful way possible. She restores the original spirit of her island faring people that they become now seafaring. They're explorers. I mean, it's a great scene when she goes into that cave and she discovers the boats. I love watching it. She has this vision and it's cool to, to talk about the sacred fire. She's she hits the drums and like the fire lights up in the cave. Oh, there's even fire symbolism. There's a fire even symbolism. The sacred there. fire. There's even and, fire. And symbolism. she sees a vision of her people, her ancestors, sailing the seas, just like she wants to do. It's it's so well done. And the music and the song in, in that is so great. So Moana handles it very well. The difference, and, and I think this is where it still is a hero's journey dynamic. She does have to leave that island. And there is clearly a threshold, the breakers, um, that she, she fails to pass the first time. Um, but that, that's a hero's journey trope, to, to, to pass a threshold, to leave the, the home behind you. That, that's unmistakable hero's journey territory there, archetypally. All right, Lou, go, go. First, first, <laughs> first, I'm still unpacking everything you're saying, so I'm working through it. <laughs> As I'm working through it, this, the first thing I realized is that one of my favorite Marvel films, Ant-Man, um, the claim is labor. He can't keep a job, and his wife says, get a job. Yes. Um, and, and by the way, Ant-Man is also a structural remake of another film, point for point for point. Uh, really? and, oh, yes. And, uh, and then, then I was thinking about um, Frozen, 
And then I was thinking, oh my gosh, um, one another one of my favorite animated movies, How to Train Your Dragon. That's a heroine's journey. They don't have a claim. They they have a claim of, of labor on him. I'm not of labor. They have a claim of succession on him. They want to yes. Be and he comes back and reinvigorates the culture and gets them to fly at the end, just like Moana does. So, well, uh, so How to Train Your Dragon is actually a heroine's journey, then, according to your and, definition, and, not a hero's journey. And by contrast, oh, let, let me forget it. Um, uh, Brave may be a hero's journey because what they want to is labor. <laughs> and she doesn't, <laughs> she does not come back to the tradition, she breaks the tradition. Yeah, well, which breaking tradition is a common heroine's yeah. labyrinth uh, thing. Which, but, but what they want from her is is to her to fill. A, 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 I think it's labor. Well, yeah. and uh, what what's interesting too is how to train your one of the big themes in the heroine's labyrinth is the beast as ally, yeah. and uh, how to train your dragon. Uh, that is yeah. like the core archetype they work with there. Yeah. <laughs> that I'm, I'm glad that this has come up because like this we're having we're bringing Lou in for the first time here. But like Cameron has been so impressed with Doug's theory of the the heroine's labyrinth, and I hope later that Lou you'll you'll look into it further because Doug's looking for a publisher. But we've got he's explained the whole theory here on on YouTube. It's it's very similar to me the kind of stuff you were talking about with uh, other people talking about story structure. Because when I started hearing what Doug was saying, I was like, oh my god, some of these stories that I was writing because we we also we've talked about this that the heroine's journey can be performed by a male protagonist and totally. a female protagonist the hero's journey can be performed by a male protagonist or a female protagonist totally that's not exclusive so there are the because i was even realizing that oh my god i have two rabbivanian kings two mythological rabbivanian kings and one of them i mean they're both male but one of them does the hero's journey and i was like oh my god the other one has done the heroine's labyrinth and i wasn't even aware of it until doug articulated and well, and so, these are these are patterns so already in movies. Like I, I didn't invent it. My what you I was trying it. to do, right? What I was trying to do is figure out when the hero's journey broke down in my book. I, I was like, well, what's the female version of it? And and I found a billion things, and none of them really answered my questions. And some of them got so far off the track from storytelling that they were unusable ideas to to a writer. Um, so I was just looking for patterns that were in movies that featured a heroine and the, these patterns were already in there. So, um, and Moana was one of the ones I studied and I love Moana because it did still have unmistakable hero's journey tropes. Like there, there's no question about it. Uh, there's even moments in Moana where themes or messages that are inherent in the hero's journey creep in through Maui. Uh, like, for instance, uh, one of the things in the hero's journey with that I have in my notes is, you know, one of the one of the main things the hero gets at the end is uh, worthiness. He's not expendable. You know, um, that's why Keith, we talked about this. That's why so many heroes refuse the call, because the call to adventure could really mean your your physical destruction. And so heroes second guess themselves. Does Moana refuse the call? Oh my God, I did. I forgot to look for that. Does Moana no, no, refuse the I, call? No, no. Moana, in a typical heroine fashion, storms off the island. Like, never, that's, that's, why, that's what I was about to say. I, I didn't look. Hero, see, that's, that's interesting. Look, heroes have the refusal of the call. Most the heroines, usually. we don't have the refusal of the they call. They usually does, skip it. Does, does Moana refuse the call? She does she, not. She is... There's one point where she's about to concede. She almost concedes to the to the who, who she is. Then she plays the the grandmother plays both the part of the herald and the part of the uh, mentor. Wise what, guy, yes. The, the the relationship character that Lou was talking about earlier. She mm -hmm. plays both. So in that yeah, case, because pivotal. when she comes back as the force ghost, she's playing <laughs> the role of the mentor. She's no playing the, the role of the the herald earlier on. The Herald, well, sort of because the grandma, I think is her name. I, I don't know if she has another name yeah, besides yeah, grandma, know. but um, she is embodied with the, the spirit of the ocean, mm -hmm. which is very clear, like the ocean. And part of the heroine's uh, labyrinth is what, something I call the black swan, which is helpful chaos or randomness. Or uh, um, a lot of times there's apocalyptic imagery, which Moana has. Her island starts to turn to ash in her visions and stuff like that. 
Um, but also the helpful chaos, with which is the grandma on the ocean. I think Lou mentioned that the ocean helps out multiple times, uh, like almost like 10 or so times, you know, knocks Maui out, <laughs> brings the stone back. It knocks you it's know, back it, on the boat every time Maui throws her off. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. so the ocean is very helpful chaos. And and there's nothing more chaotic than an ocean. So an ocean is a perfect symbol for chaotic yeah. nature. Um, well, it's the archetypical symbol for chaos. When you talk about the 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 primordial ocean of chaos, in, in terms of in terms of the relationship between nature and the heroine, but for Joseph Campbell, the sea is usually that liminal space that the hero crosses into, like Moana does. So, uh, in my opinion, it serves a double. It serves two archetypal themes: one, the vast emptiness of liminal space, which is a hero's journey thing, far from home, and then two the sort of helpful chaotic force of nature, you know, the force, I, I think uh, uh, Lou even said, it's like the force <laughs> yeah, uh, in right. Star Wars. I, I'm now wondering if Black Panther is a heroine's journey. Um, with the animal companion. Yeah. Well, and Maui is the beast as ally in this. He yeah. literally turns into animals. He's half yeah. man, half beast. Um, you know, so but what I was saying, the the idea of expendability being an issue with heroes on the hero's journey, Maui has the crisis of confidence that heroes have in the hero's journey. And 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 the idea of expendability, there's a scene where Moana is like, what's this tattoo? And it's a woman throwing a baby into the sea. And, and it's Maui. You know, she's she's casting him into the sea. And um, he is discovered by the gods and, you know, given all these these powers, but this idea of expendability, which is usually a warrior issue, a, a theme that warriors face uh, Maui, even though like Maui is not the lead character, the theme is present for Maui um, very clearly in Moana. And I love that. Okay. And he wait, has, he has, he, sorry. Oh, no, no. And I, I was about, I was about to, cause I was, I, I had a, a sudden thought that contrasts star Wars with this. Because if we remember when we were talking about the Star Star Wars, the original Star Wars movie, Doug, we said, okay, that's a hero's journey that we've got here. But yet in your examples in your book, you occasionally gave examples of the heroine's journey tropes that appeared in Princess Leia. When you when you focus on Princess Leia, there are here she's okay, escaped right. the opening scene is her escaping her native culture. She is escaping her native culture. She is captured. You talk about the penetration, the insertion. When, 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 the, when the droid is coming in, she's captured. That even though we say, so this is why I was trying to structure this, that, okay, this is a hero's journey story, but that when you have a, a heroine or like a, a, a strong female figure coming in, they embody female, they embody those heroine journey tropes, heroine's labyrinth tropes, because we saw that in Princess Leia. So like when oh. Princess Leia comes in, there is heroine's journey stuff in here. You just said the opposite here, because yeah. we have a female doing the hero's journey. And then when you said somebody else comes in like Princess Leia, that person, when that person comes in, that person happens to have like glancing strikes of the hero's journey as part of their stuff. Man, that's fascinating. Well, the loss of confidence is a common problem for heroes. Uh, the the um, After the belly of the beast, you know, you, you there's a disgrace. Hero loses confidence before they re-engage. Maui has that issue, not Moana. Moana right. Maui's like, I'm nothing, you know, I'm nothing without my my hook. So he he's, he's going to give up. He, he was going to give up. Um, but he, like Han Solo, he adopts the 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 heroine's cause uh, by the end, which is definitely in Star Wars. Um, but for continuity in Star Wars, Princess Leia has the the Death Star plans, right? Yep. That's the lifeblood, the continuity of the Rebel Alliance. If that's not protected, she's protecting the sacred fire. If that's not protected, the Rebel Alliance is destroyed, which is proven in um, Rogue One. They're ready to give up. So her ability to protect that sacred fire is what she's doing. It's her cause that starts that movie. And, and the heroes are the ones who adopt her cause, just like Maui adopts Moana's cause really late 
<laughs> kind of like Han Solo, <laughs> yeah, really yeah. late in the story, he adopts her cause, but he wasn't on board for most of that story. He was very selfish. I think just like Lou said, he's a lot like Han Solo. He, he's selfish. He's uh, arrogant. He, he's uh, dismissive. <laughs> you know, he's not interested. Han Solo threatens to kick Luke off the ship. Maui does throw Moana off the ship. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Yeah, I always yeah, you thought find Han yourself Solo... floating home, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except for floating, literally. <laughs> except for yeah. yeah, Maui actually tries to make her float home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah, I always thought Han Solo like out manlyed Luke <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> pretty severely in in A New Hope. He's always talking down to him. This is so fascinating. I hope that some, I noticed some of the comments very early on in the, this, like I didn't really pay attention to Moana or something again, because like, this is a bizarre sort of off of theme kind of movie for us to be covering. But I hope that after this, and in the context of the hero's journey and the heroine's labyrinth, people will watch this one again and go, oh my God, why is this one actually so great? And what is it doing? And why is it so archetypical? Well, there's the, the one thing that I think is amazing with the with the sacred fire um, symbol, which is a heroine labyrinth thing, that the idea of a symbol of the sacred fire. In this story, I believe there's two heroines. There's Moana, and I also think um, um, Tefiti is the other one. She has her sacred fire stolen, which is a common issue in a heroine's labyrinth story. Maui steals the sacred fire from her. He takes it right from her, from that spiral. And it's it, it labyrinth-like. Right. That's a hero. The, the extraction, it's it's a symbolic rape is what it is, in my theory. And he does that. He takes it from her. He steals it from her. And this causes this toxicity. And she becomes Te Ka, which is um, the villain of Moana's story. And like the villains in heroine-centric stories, they're disguised. We don't know it's Tifidi until the end when she when she You're comes right. Back. There's the element of disguise too. So so right. So she is disguised. The thing that I and there's the thing that I love the most is when she returns that sacred fire to Tifidi, she turns back. And you have the broken spell, which is the uh, big a big theme in the heroine's labyrinth as well. The the rapid rearrangement of the culture again which is very dramatic in Moana. I mean, the second she plugs that Pawanu stone in there, I mean, it's like green spiraling life just overtakes the islands and the home culture and everything. So um, she breaks that spell. So it's very consistent with the archetypal themes of, of the heroine's labyrinth. With uh, And there's even a shield maiden moment with... Um, Teka oh. is about to kill Maui. His, his, his hook is broke. He's lying defenseless in the same proximity as the heroine. And right before Teka is about to smack him, uh, Moana holds up that Puanu stone and just fearlessly approaches Teka. It's actually, it's, 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 as far as the, I'm sure you guys feel the same way, the animation in it is, is, is unbelievable. Yeah, that too. It's winning on a lot of levels. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable. We also have the uh, yes, the heroines. So anyway, I'm just there's there's archetypal nuance themes from the heroines labyrinth that show up in Moana. That doesn't mean it's a perfect heroines labyrinth story. I do still think it follows a structural model. Of, you know, the heroine departs the native culture and goes out, and there are combat themes. They they run into the uh, Kakamora. <laughs> um, and I thought Disney handled it well. The, the big argument these days about the hero's journey is that it's xenophobic because you portray an, a foreign militant culture in a negative light. Uh, they got around that by making them cute coconuts that are adorable. <laughs> so there was no xenophobic uh, outer culture she had to contend with, even though there was like a stand in for it. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're, um, they're kind of the Sandman, aren't they? The Sandman? Yeah, <laughs> you're talking about the sand people. Sand people. people. Sand people. <laughs> sand people. Well, yeah. that's nah, well, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I was actually thinking about that, and I was thinking like um, uh, asteroid strikes because I've I've actually talked a lot about the attack by sand people. I actually talked specifically about because I had scenes 
And I was talking specifically to Cameron about being attacked by sand people. And we came to the conclusion, being attacked by sand people, not necessary. So I ended up having, I ended up removing that. So the sand people, <laughs> the, 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 like, because sand people occurred right before that he met the Herald. So it, right. when you're talking about some right. kind of conflict that you can't when, deal with, right? You guys have watched Moana more recently than I have. When, when, when in the story does the coconut attack occur? It's like right. after she two. is left, but it's before she's she's uh, and she's, after she's met after she has met the demigod. Uh, okay, Ma okay. Ma so yeah. so it's actually gonna be an extended tie fighter attack so that's what yes. i was thinking asteroid yes. strike yes. flying through the the asteroid or the destruction of alderaan yes. i was thinking oh now here we are with an attack by some coconuts here yeah but yes. this is in the same <laughs> position yeah <laughs> attack it's, by it's, coconut is something like asteroid them. strikes when maybe they, we'll, we'll use that attack by fighters, coconut when attack tie fighters. yeah yeah right. i would say structurally it shows up at the same point as the tie fighter attack on the millennium falcon uh, you're talking about when Luke and Han yeah, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say it comes in a, the near the end of Act Two. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's the uh, first off. So the first off is is there's yeah, Tie Fighter attack or yeah, yeah. asteroids of Alderaan kind of thing, yeah. right? <laughs> I, the because I the last time I had watched Moana, I did, did not have any information from the heroine's labyrinth. So as I was watching it this afternoon, I was going, "Okay, wow, I'm seeing I'm seeing both here. This this is going yeah. to be a, an extremely interesting story to talk about in the context of both. Like they're in, both in, there, yeah, because there's so many elements here. Yeah, the wise guide is a, I mean, a benchmark of hero's journey. You know, uh, the idea of mastering some sort of competency or skill, which Moana does. She has to learn how to sail. Mo Maui te literally teaches her the ropes. I mean, I mean, in the most literal sense of the term. But also Maui must remaster his skills, which are more for combat. He has to relearn how to use his hook. He, he struggles with it through the film. So he is not he's like Luke in Empire Strikes Back, where uh, he's trying to do the handstand and falls over like he's not good at his skills. Uh, and he must remaster them so that those are heroes journey tropes, the ma the competency of skills, um, which a lot of times for combat uh, is a big trope for the hero's journey. And that's here. And both heroes do the heroine and the heroine, both the hero and the heroine both do it. Moana is also a relationship comedy with the sexual element removed. <laughs> uh, well, there, there's one scene. I always get a kick out of it where Maui's singing, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. and it's right at the end when he's about to spin her away and trap her she looks like she's just completely entranced with him yeah. <laughs> almost like he's putting on his male spell and uh she's like so to me i think that was an overtone of attraction like you said like a romantic comedy kind of thing where the the guy had the upper hand for a little bit <laughs> we must unlearn what you have learned Yes. I am going to need to jump off in a second. Okay. I'm loving this. Um, <laughs> well, Lou, I want to have you back more. Yep. We just got started here because we got to, we got to talk about um, what Ant-Man is a remake of. Okay. Okay. And... Let me make, uh, we need to talk about Ant-Man. <laughs> Ant-Man. <laughs> we, we need also like we started in order to understand Lou's philosophy of storytelling, like, but we need to understand, we need, we need, we need to spend a whole hour on, we, we did this with, with Doug. We started with the heroine's labyrinth. We yeah, need to spend a whole hour on on your story structure and your your storytelling structure. I would love to hear that. I mean, right right when you said antagonists and villains are, I was like, okay, that that works immediately. Uh, yeah, I need to talk about the six characters. Uh, yeah, because you've got six. Um, is it, I thought it was seven, but is it six? Well, there's, characters? there's three main characters, and then there are one, two, three, four, five, six, six other characters that revolve around them. Okay, so we we've, we've film, got to do that. But when you have that many characters, you'll be able to find all six. Wow. We've got it. We can talk about Ant Man. We can do the same kind of thing for Ant Man, yeah. which I will also surprise people. I'm sure, like, wait, we need to go deep into Ant Man. We do, and then also Ant Man's I, I underrated. Would, I, I like Ant Man. Ant Man's brilliant. Dark Knight. Ant Man is brilliant, but it is a yeah. it is a it is a structural remake, scene for scene, of a uh, something. Now, actually, Tomacrat says we we won't spoil it. Let's not spoil it. Yeah. We'll, we'll just hold that until we do Ant Man. But Tomacrat says we watch Ant Man now. See it as Ocean's Love. That's not it. Nope. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> it's a film that everybody copied, but not this way. 
and then <laughs> doesn't take anything from the story. It just takes the structure. Hmm. Okay. That's awesome. Because I, what's interesting is like the hero's journey for all these stories can look wildly different, but have identical structure underneath the skin. Well, I'll it's say when I, when I outline now, I'll pick a, a, a film that I think has a structure I'm interested in and I'll outline the structure and then I'll just keep reducing that outline until it is just, 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 just like placeholder nouns, like, you know, uh, uh, protagonist at home, authority figure says, don't go, you know, then protagonist meets mentor and I'll break it down like that. And then I'll see, and then I'll build it back up from there. I love that. And, and uh, you know, take it down to like, just like, like 10 sentences with no, no place or time or character and then build back up. And Ant-Man took a, a really popular story that a lot of people copied, but they copied theme, they copied look, they copied setting, they copied style. Oh, and wow. doesn't take any of that. Ant-Man strips everything off to the skeleton and then builds a completely new heist comedy on that skeleton. On that structure. Huh. He, yeah. he copied yeah. the structure. He didn't copy the theme you're talking about. He didn't copy right. the, the right. look or the whatever. He went to the structure of the absolutely bones, the story. Yep. yep, yep, yep. Oh, I can't wait to hear that. Okay. You know, and it and it did it just one for one. Like like something like Lion King is is Excalibur and Henry the Fourth and uh, and 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 um, Hamlet, but uh, all together along with Symbol of the White Lion. But uh, but but this is just one thing, just completely stripped down to the skeleton and all the meat put back on. See, that's interesting to me, and it just it just keeps verifying. I believe the problem with some of the modern movies is they don't believe that there's anything under the hood. They just put stuff on a screen yep. without the realization that there's a structure holding it up or an archetype holding it up. Like you, like you said, you could strip it all the way down to just a couple words, which stand in as a, as a superstructure. I don't think they're doing that with modern writing in, in some of these stories. I feel like they... I think they look at Star Wars. They're like, okay, Tie Fighters, lightsabers, masks. That's what Star Wars is. So give me Tie Fighters. We'll just reverse the cult. I just feel like they just take the images, the superficial that's, that's images. That's literally what they did with the Force Awakens. They just took Star Wars, smashed it up, and then reassembled it. T totally. Um, yeah. Totally. Without without thinking what it meant. Um, well, wow. well, that's more proof to me that that it's the underlying source. That good stories have the underlying source power thought through before you just start slapping on images. Yep. yep. So wait, I realize I'm asking a lot of you here, Lou, but if we need to actually dive into your story structure before we do the 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 Dark Knight, yep. Would you do that with us? Would you do before we do the Dark Knight? Would you do your story structure and then come back for the Dark Knight analysis? Sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Then awesome. I'll, I'll email. Uh, uh, um, the, the community has specifically asked us to do the Dark Knight, so we got to do it well. That was a, a one that's and that's why I thought of you. Okay. But, but we got to do it right. The community has asked for this because it's such an amazing movie. So if we need if we need a whole episode of prep before the Dark Knight, <laughs> Lou, you, you'll prep us for the episode. It might be the same episode. It might be part one, part two of the same episode. Okay. Well, that's Lou, fine. I have a question okay. for you. Right. We need a prep. Okay. So maybe right. that's maybe that's next Tuesday. What's we'll uh, it? Let me see. I, I guess I, let me look at my schedule after this. Uh, Dread and Fuzz. I, I I agree with you about the Last Jedi. It's an interesting failure. The others are 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 completely formulaic. At least the Last Jedi tried. It failed. But it tried. All right. I gotta go. Okay. Thank All you, right. Everybody. I'll be in touch. All right. Later, Lou. Bye, Thank Lou. you so much. I've enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh man, that'll be great listening to what he has to say. Oh man, this is great. Things. I. I Lou gave me his course like soon after we first met. This was years ago, but he was like, "All right, he he." We met in a Starbucks, and he gave me his course on on story structure. And I, I'm sure he's going to bring this up, but I, I, this is only a small part of his narrative. But this has stuck with me ever since he talked about this. And that's how you know there's something there. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, I, well, yes. So, so when he was talking, when we were talking about the differences between villains and antagonists, and that's definitely nomenclature and terminology that we have got to incorporate into our story analysis. That not all antagonists are villains. 
that a villain and antagonist is different. And that sounds good that you, you have villains, but then in some stories, the antagonist, is something else and the, Oh, Lou blow your, blew your mind. Okay. Well, there's more coming. Lou's I know awesome. it's, it's difficult for Lou to stay for like four hours, but okay. So he's going <laughs> to come back. I know uh, Lou is fantastic. Lou is fantastic. Uh, but okay. But he, he this is going to come up on that theme. And when I heard this, uh, so I'll ask you the, the same question. He's probably going to ask this, but the antagonist, do you know uh, Captain America, the original Captain America movie? The first Avenger? Yeah, the first Captain America movie, yes. Yes. Okay. Who is the... Once you realize this, you completely change your perspective on everything as far as persp- uh, villains and antagonists. Who is the antagonist? <laughs> as Antagonist is the person who is opposite of the protagonist or person, entity, the entity. The, the entity could be whatever. But the entity that is opposite of your protagonist, who is putting obstacles in the way of your protagonist, um, is it uh, Sam uh, Tucci's character? The uh, oh, well, I I forgot his name. He's the guy who gives ends up giving him the serum. He's the scientist. Uh, um, I forgot his name. <laughs> he's he's no, the no, no, compassionate. No, no. Uh, I, I, I may have accidentally primed you wrong by saying character or individual. So let's go. That's why I said entity, because it could be organization. It could be like this. This is the thing that is putting the obstacles in front. Okay, the protagonist oh. is the protagonist is Captain America. Captain America. Is, is it the U.S. Army? That's it. Wow. Okay. It's, yeah. Because or, they're hassling them. Exactly. Or broadly speaking, the U.S. government. Yes. Because because I, I, as soon as I realized this, I realized that I often made. Uh, I often made villains who were facilitating the goals of the protagonist. Now that's okay, but that means that that villain is not the antagonist. Right. I think a villain is so much more than an antagonist. A villain does not simply antagonize your hero. All my notes in world. Yep. They all got it. They got it. All my notes on world building is you have to understand that there is usually an ethical struggle in these stories. And the villain is one who has, who has mastered a, 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 a way of life that works. It may be destructive. It may have a lot of victims, but it works. Villains are successful. They are good. They rarely lose. Darth Vader never lost a fight until the end of Return of the Jedi. Like Villains are serious. They have codified this way of life. And they're so successful because of it. And they have followers because of it. So a villain is is a very specific character, a very specific person. An antagonist sounds like my baby brother, like (laughs) bothering me. (laughs) But but, but the villain (laughs) villain can be the antagonist. There are villains who are antagonists. That's that's it's it's very it's very classic for the villain and the antagonist to be the same. So that's that's Uh, often the case. Right. But in more sophisticated story structures. They may not be right. And then I, I you agree. A really more interesting story. Totally agree. Because so it's it's ob- no uh, uh, to the villain is in wait what is Sable Phoenix saying the villain is in op is is the opposite of the protagonist. Well, oh. no. Well, we got more to say on that. I got more to say on that, but I'm going to lose say it. I'm going to lose say it. Not necessarily well, in opposite. What I would say is no. almost the reverse. Usually heroes begin to define themselves by their opposition to the villain. Um, So the villain has codified a way of life that has permeated itself throughout society. and And the hero is what stands up to that villain. So it's the hero that stands in opposition to the villain. And you have to ask yourself, this is world building real quick, but do we have insurgent good or insurgent evil? Insurgent good is like Star Wars, where the evil is propagated already throughout the world, and a small group of insurgent good guys rises up to to face them. With an insurgent evil story, it's like Lord of the Rings, where the good is in decay, and evil is sneaking back into the world as an insurgent force. So it depends, but usually the good guys are what stand in opposition to the villain, whatever is driving the source of this evil that's in the world one way or the other, whether it's Darth Vader out in the open now or Sauron, who's kind of reconstituting slowly, you know? So, so the, so, okay. So yeah, to, just to, to go back to the Captain America 
because because the the villain is clearly Red Skull. Yes, yeah, he's a no question. About villain it. is Red Skull, but but you have to because Lou is going to ask, what does Captain America want? What does Steve Rogers want to st- and, to be big? Well, I guess to stand up to bullies. No, well, no. Is well, it's, what's your what's your answer? Because you've thought about it, I think. Yeah. So it's the Captain that Steve Rogers wants to in one word fight. I want to go fight. He wants to fight. He wants to be in the art. He's joining. He's trying to join. Oh, true. Yeah. He wants to go fight. I want to go fight. And so that's his want. And what is stopping him from fighting? Not Red Skull. It's the the U.S. bureaucracy. Right. The thing (laughs) that's stopping him from fighting is the U.S. government. So as soon as you identify that what Steve Rogers wants as the protagonist is to go and fight, he wants to fight. What is stopping him from fighting? What is constantly putting obstacles in his way to going and fighting? The U.S. government or the U.S. Army directly. It's the U.S. Army who is stopping that. And it's actually the villain. Now, Red Skull is the villain who is actually facilitating Steve Rogers' want because Red Skull is the villain that only he can defeat. And as soon as the U.S. Army realizes that, then they're going to send Steve Rogers as Captain America after Red Skull. So actually, when you watch that movie, that movie is over as soon as the U.S. Army steps aside and tells him to go get Red Skull. Hmm. Because at that point, Steve Rogers has conquered his his, his protagonist. Yeah, his really antagonist. Good. He's doing that like propaganda dance with. Yeah, uh, yeah I know. Because that's what that's all, all that's going on, and it's keeping him away from fighting. But as soon as he overcomes the U.S. Army and can go fight, that's actually the end of the movie. You just you watch, and I was and I've thought about that because I was watching that. The, there's not as much emotional resonance. And okay, now for the last 15 minutes of the movie, we're gonna watch Captain America punching Red Skull. <laughs> you know, we're gonna yeah. have fight because now now Captain America is getting in touch with this villain you know, in a very physical way. He's, he's in touch with the <laughs> yeah. villain, and so you're gonna see that. But you don't have the emotional impact of Captain America finally getting to beat up Red Skull. It's been a while since I've watched the movie. Yeah. The emotional impact, the actual conclusion of the story was finally Captain America overcoming the U.S. Army and getting what he wants. I'm going to get in this fight. Interesting. You know, I made my case a long time ago that superhero stories a lot of times will emulate or eventually move toward a heroine's labyrinth story. So it's interesting that you say that because a fight against that's a fight against your native culture. <laughs> that, 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 oh, you're right. That is. That's uh, I Captain mean, America's. And may well, who knows? Maybe that might be something to. I don't know if that part was in the heroine's labyrinth, the distinction between protagonist and villain. But if you have, I don't know if it's well, it, but it there might is be. a claim That's against a point. It, it is a claim against. Well, it's it's clear. Well, you're you're actually making me think about it because all of the rules and things that he runs into, even the failing the physical exam, those are all native culture rules, man. You're not tall enough, you're not strong enough, like you don't meet the criteria. Uh, it's the red tape that that is that is stopping him. Um, however, uh, a lot of heroes uh, j- uh, origin stories do still emulate a hero's journey, and he does leave his native culture to fight a foreign militant power. So, right. so the villain, but see, okay, but that's the distinction. The villain right. is yes. definitely an outsider. You got to go uh, the foreign military power. You got to go fight the villain. Well, and what's interesting, you know, just to bring it back to Moana. Uh, the, the although this is a hero's journey story, Take Te, Teka is the is the villain. She's a culture destroyer, but she is not militant. She is not considered a militant villain like you would find in a hero's journey story. She's she's actually what I would call the reformed villain, um, or in this case, more of a restored heroine uh, goddess. Um, but she's not a militant culture destroyer, but her her issue is destroying the culture. It's turning it to ash. And someone pointed out in the chat earlier, Moana never enters combat with, with uh, Teka. Maui does, you know, the stand-in for the hero in the in the journey at certain, you know, tropes. Um, Maui fights her, but Moana never engages in combat with, with um, Teka. She does the shield maiden moment. And she restores the sacred fire. That's exactly what happens in that. And then the the spell breaks, and, and the 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 native culture is restored. 
So Sable Phoenix, thank you very much for the five dollar super chat. Sable Phoenix says, please do all the Captain America movies and table talk sometime. I, I I'm not familiar with all of them. I let would me have tell to you something, Sable. I don't know if you agree or or Captain America Winter Soldier is one of my all time favorite Marvel movies. Well, that's Dr Druden is, is is that is, says that Dude, right on. Oh, Winter Soldier is fantastic too. Says Winter Jeff. Soldier is just awesome, and it yeah. follows. Mostly, believe it or not, structurally, a heroine's labyrinth story. It's a fight against his native culture. Okay. Big time. Uh, because well, the native culture has been compromised by Hydra in, in this case. But uh, Winter Soldier is just awesome. The action, the storyline, the visuals, the, the carriers. Uh, I mean, you can't get... I mean, it's it's Marvel at its best, in my opinion. I, I know. So this is going to come up with Lou, because Lou is very pro-Marvel up until Endgame. He may, I mean, I don't know what he says after oh, that. Oh, he doesn't like Endgame? Well, no, I mean, concluding with Endgame. I mean, oh, you know, okay. The whole arc, that, that arc. Lou is going to use a lot in his examples of his story structure and how that whole, how, how Marvel managed to construct all of those movies structurally with these, what did he say, seven different characters that, that each story... Oh, really? That, that each story goes around. And, and Lou has even got that... Uh, in a particular movie, a character will have a certain experience and that allows them to play the role, another role in the next movie. Like when, when they're playing, an, uh, I'm going to let him explain it all. Oh, but wow. they will set something up in one movie and that the character will have an experience or deal with some kind of situation. And then that means that in the next movie, they're not playing that. They can't play that role again because they've already been through that story. But that <laughs> sets them up to play the next role and so in the next movie all the roles shift well and, i um i'm so inclined it, to agree movie. with lou and it sounds like you as well heath i really think marvel was excelling at an unprecedented level through endgame iron man which is still one of the best marvels uh movies out there 2008 uh iron man iron man to endgame is unbelievable storytelling i love it they did so well and it's so amazing to me how after Endgame, they became so bad <laughs> at storytelling. Like, I'm like, are these the same people? Like, what happened here? Uh, of course, there's ideological, you know, reasons why as well. I think they tried to do other things besides tell stories that really, you know, hamstrung them. But um, I, I love Marvel through Endgame as well. I loved it. I loved Endgame. Not everyone does, but I thought Endgame was great. I, I would have, I would have to, if we do that, I would really have to go back and watch them because I, because I was not a, I'm not, I'm, I don't know comic books. That's not my side of things, and so I wasn't really paying attention to Marvel, but that they are, but other people so much were, and I was like, oh my god, so I need to watch some of these movies, and I was trying to follow along, so I was experiencing all of that as an outsider. And of course, when Endgame came, that's a very unfortunate title because I thought it was actually all over at that point. I thought I was actually they should have they, they should have just said we're done and then started with the X Men or something and just slow. What they needed to do was to get away from the. They got themselves to a point where they had so many storylines they were incorporating, and somehow they did it. When those storylines pretty much all came to a head, they started to sort of try to continue it. What they should have done is go back to small storytelling with smaller characters and build those characters up to get more complex. And mm -hmm. they, they just kept staying complex and, and it got to, I saw when I was watching Dr. Strange and the multiverse of madness, I was like, this is gibberish. This is, I don't even know what the story is. And it had Wanda Maximoff who I thought would have been, I thought she was lining up to be a fantastic character and they just, they ruined her. It's like, I really don't think they know what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I haven't. I don't think I've watched anything since Endgame. I went to see Endgame in the theater. Well, I loved it. I mean, the the final battle when I mean, there's Pegasus. I thought to myself when I was watching Endgame, I was kind of overwhelmed watching it, and I was like, "Wow!" I was like, "This is like all the imagery of Western culture." <laughs> you have Pegasus flying through the battle. You have Iron, you know, the technological hero. You have Spider Man in there, and Thor, a Norse god, is involved. It was just an incredible visual uh, feast. Um, in Captain America, he had a broken shield. He was still fighting. And anyway, it's. It, I thought it was great. And I just don't think uh, they lost the magic after that. And they're still they're still struggling to get it back.
I think just to, to follow on what you were saying, that one of the things that I am big on, which may have happened here, but I see it a lot because uh, I, I haven't watched things beyond uh, beyond Endgame, but I've watched other things. That I'm big on you can't reset the characters. <laughs> that if you resolve yeah. certain things, you can't reset them. And you said something about like continuing big or something like that. Yeah. Y you can't, you, you see stories where, okay, a character is dealing with a big issue and then they resolve it. Yeah. Okay. But then what, what do they do next? Well, they're supposed to do something completely different next. Something and actually different. they did that in the early Marvel, like Lou is going to talk about. But if you're like, no, wait a minute, but this character is supposed to be dealing with this issue. You can't reset them. Yeah, you, you can you can continue a story's. Um, I mean, just like in real life, like some you know you overcome one issue in your life, and there's there's something else waiting for you at the other end, you know. And then there's you a different a, issue. You right, there's a different issue that you're you're dealing with, and it's your life, so it all you know it's it's the same story, <laughs> you know. So you, you can continue these things in a way that still resonates, um, but I do think you have to know how to tell stories, and I, I don't think you can just slap images on and say, you know this is going to work because it's the same character. I mean, you have to still tell the story. Yeah. Broken shields are incredibly symbolic. 100%. All right. Well, I think, I, I think this is, was an incredibly important conversation. Like I said, we're just bringing Lou on. We said to come back. So there'll be some more Lou. Cause I, I love hearing Lou's take on things. And this is, um, this is a different one. I know for those of us who were, who were here because it's, it's a, you know, a, an animated film, things aren't blowing up constantly and blood and all of that. But if you listen, if you're here and maybe we'll bring some other people in on replay and stuff like that, that this is, this is a really good one to study as far as story structure goes and the, the different tropes and appearances from hero's journey. Well, that was our story structure, but the items that are in it. I, I will say there's a couple more from the heroes, heroines labyrinth that are interestingly intact with Moana, with Moana as well, the doppelganger effect between the masked minotaur and the beast as ally, they're usually mere images of each other in some way. And in this case, they're both gods and goddesses. <laughs> you know, Maui is a demigod and you have Teka, who's also a goddess. Um, so uh, they're, they're both these types of characters and most of the other characters in the story, especially her mom and dad and everything, are not that. So... You still have this little bit of a doppelganger uh, effect going on with the beast as ally and the masked minotaur. Uh, and also we do have the aiding the fragile power or entrusting the fragile power where something that's where some uh, some character that seems insignificant, small or childlike ends up being critical in the final battle. Hey, 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 hey is, is ridiculously a liability. It doesn't even peck the seed properly mm -hmm. but it swallows the puanu stone or the puanu stone at the right moment and saves the day so you still have that fragile power element and it's because the heroine always vouched for the the fragile power she was she protected hey hey the whole time <laughs> so um there's that as well so anyway there's just a bunch of of tropes that still line up with the heroine's labyrinth um that that fall that are in moana and uh it works and it still does the hero's journey in a lot of ways. So you can do both and still succeed. It's the storyteller who who's collecting these archetypes in a, in a story arc that did all the, that got it right. And according to Lou, from what he said, they also incorporated cultural or historical archetypes as well from um, the Maori. So, I mean, and by the way, you know, I check the Nielsen ratings every week just out of curiosity. Moana, week in and week out to this day, Moana is still one of the most watched movies in the top 10. Week after week after week after week. Moana. And that means Moana. something. It's doing something right. Exactly. And our hypothesis is that's on a structural level. That it's doing right. something structurally right. Structurally and archetypally, it is resonating and people... It has that's that's what rewatchability is usually. That, that's what where that comes in. There's something about this that that works um, at a primal level. And 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 Moana came out what 2016. So for it to still hit the the Nielsen top ten for uh, movies is is you know streaming movies that is is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yes, Druden Fuzz says, yes, Mana was really great. I just wish they could have repeated that with Rhea. Who is that? Rhea came out, I think, during the pandemic. It was a, 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 a I think, a Chinese story. Oh. It's actually a good movie. It just came out at a weird time and kind of became forgettable. But the movie itself wasn't that bad. It was definitely decent. Okay. I wasn't, I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, uh, it, it right. became forgettable. Well, is there are there is there anything else we need to say here with regard to this one? Because I I have uh, we don't have to go for four hours on this one. Because I don't oh, no. <laughs> but, uh, but is there anything else that we have missed that we should be saying? And, and, and in a certain sense, like I do, I feel like we just got started with the dialogue with Lou that's going to continue over several other episodes. But yeah, this is uh, such an uh, an amazing film that. Uh, yeah, I thought it was great what Lou was talking about in terms of it lining up with the Star Wars tropes. That's great. I think my favorite is the Falcon comes in at the end of Saber going, Yahoo! <laughs> they, I, they must have thought of, I think they must have thought about those. I mean, they, they must have. I, I think they must have. I think that the structure. Yeah. Well, I, but it works, that, you know? That can't be accidental. But, you know, well, I, I think that it's also, does, does Lou have a website or a YouTube channel? Uh, Lou does not have, does not just run a YouTube channel. Uh, like there, there may be a couple of things up on a channel, but uh, but not to speak of. So that's so I'm the one who mainly does that. Lou does have. We should put this out. Uh, Lou Lou's website. Well, he's got the web. I'll put the Kickstarter out too. But he has a general website right here with all of his stuff. LouAnders.com. I'll put that there, and let me go ahead and put that in the Discord server as well. Uh, Lou Anders. Yeah, and also a, a great way for very little money uh, to go on and support a Kickstarter. His, I think, Lou's launched today, right? Is that right? Lou launched today. Lou launched he because he wasn't live during the morning grind. Otherwise, I would have said something. But uh, he actually launched while we were still live on the morning grind because when I when I finished, he was live. Uh, but then also Lou's Kickstarter. You know, if you even back for a dollar there. Um, Means that he's he he used all of his connections for this. He may not have emphasized this as much. He used all of his connections as an editor, a fantasy editor, as he was the editor of Pyre Books, and he gave me a whole bunch of different fantasy stories that or novels that he had edited that I had uh, read, um, that, um, and, and and got back with all of those people to create stories in his world. Uh, wow. So that's what he's running right now. Um, so Lou's Kickstarter is right there. It includes Pyre, an imprint. Like he was talking about this one. I love this one. Oh wow! Uh, have you ever read this one? No. I, this this one is fantastic wow. because it's about dungeon crawling. Now it is it is sex and violence. What what is that called? Ooh, two of the Barrow. Sex and oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, that's the kind of stuff you write. This <laughs> is, is is sex and violence. It starts. And in fact, I want to read it again. I've been thinking I got to read this again because it starts with a, a dungeon crawl it starts with a dungeon crawl and ends with a dungeon crawl it's like intentionally like a fantasy version of a dungeon crawl in, that's in awesome Britain. and uh but lou was saying that yeah i mean the sex in it he was like oh my god i had to uh like like if i was i'm glad i was reading it by myself trying to you know, <laughs> stuff like this uh but yeah lou's got uh the kickstarter running he's got the the thrones and bones like this is so his you know middle grade fictions i've got them all within arm's reach so thrones and bones is his wow. world uh and then so he's he, he he's really interesting because he this is traditionally published you know this is traditionally published all the tri his trilogy is uh but then his th this story anthology he's self-publishing but then all of his rpg material in his world he's also self-publishing wow i mean so that's just so prolific mm -hmm. that's a lot uh, going on all right. Well, everybody, do make sure you go and check out uh, Lou's Kickstarter, but then also also Hawaii Bird. Check that out, and then yeah, please come by uh, Good Night Sword as well. We're gonna be we're I'm gonna do a live stream to wrap up Good Night Sword. In oh we well, we got 44 backers. Somebody came. All right, in. good job, so somebody. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> we're gonna I'm gonna be uh, sending out emails and promoting and stuff like here in the last 48 hours, which is what I'm gonna do as soon as I get off this stream, and then we'll do a live stream on Thursday night that uh, uh, concludes. Good night, sword. Uh, awesome. All right. 
uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. We can actually get more sleep tonight. <laughs> so, then we'll, we'll, we'll coordinate, but then it may be that Lou comes back and um, next week, and we do like we do part one of uh, good uh, of Dark Knight. I'll ask Brianna when she's. Hopefully, she'll be available for the next two two. Okay. And uh, by the way, Heath, I was going to tell you, I took some notes down from Star Trek Three, our discussion, mm-hmm. and I, I wrote down kind of a comprehensive. You know, Doug and Heath fix Star Trek three. <laughs> so I've got uh, a summary. It only take two or three minutes, but a quick summary of what if, if we could fix Star Trek three, what it would look like, where the changes oh, came in. Well, we need to we need to put that out as like a dedicated video, like a, a tight video, like this. Here's we should do that. That cool. yeah, it, it, it was pretty cool. I, I was going through my notes. I was like, man, and oh, and I came up with one answer to an unanswered question while we did the stream. Oh, okay. which character should have refused the call? And uh, while talking to my father, Chekhov, we decided Chekhov was the perfect character to refuse the call because of the uh, how much PTSD he would have had with Khan. Anyway, I'll put it all together in a summary. And uh, it it, uh, it oh. sounds pretty cool. I actually like what we came up with all together um, with a, a revised Star Trek three with the same basic story, but a few tweaks here and there. Chekhov, Chekhov feels right, too. Because we had bounced yeah. Sulu, but that didn't seem quite right. But check off your and you're right. If he you, you made that call back to Khan, yeah. Like you, you, the, my dad and I talked about it at length, and uh, we, the more we explored check off, <clears throat> the more we felt that he really went through a hell of a lot in Star Trek II to the point of trauma traumatization, <clears throat> being asked by his captain to go back out there right away. A perfect character to be like i don't know if i'm in on this one and then of course he would change his mind but um yeah good stuff we did good we we came up with some good stuff with star trek 3 we did we did and i, I said i need to clip it and we'll put it someplace because i just I, i've started clipping more stuff out for this channel but i, I started with the morning grind stuff so awesome. yes we have great conversations that need to get out there in the world thank you everybody awesome. for being here and thank you for everybody who's gonna come through on the replay as well I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for being here. This has been incredible. I will see you all tomorrow. Tomorrow is World Building Wednesday. So we will do World Building Wednesday tomorrow on the morning grind. That will be at 9.30 a.m. Central. And then, by the way, we do have a table talk tomorrow. Very strange that we've got a table talk tomorrow, Wednesday night. Uh, I will be uh, speaking with uh, Michelle. Michelle with two L's, as she says. Michelle with two L's. From Force of Light Entertainment, we're going to be talking about good and evil in storytelling and that what that's reflection is on our society. We've talked with a lot of people, uh, or a series of people, on good and evil in storytelling. Actually, we haven't really gotten into that, Doug. But no. Lou, Lou and I talked about good and evil in storytelling. Cameron and I talked about good and evil in storytelling. Uh, of course, Lou and I come at it from more of an atheistic perspective. Cameron, of course, came at it from a... Uh, 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 Islamic perspective and especially Sufi also perspective. I thought it'd be interesting to talk to uh, Michelle because she is a uh, Christian minister, although I'm not sure of what denomination we'll talk about that. And she recently completed uh, a PhD in theology, like as in last month. So wow. she will be coming at it from that perspective. So we will be talking. And the only time she can do it is on a Wednesday night. So, so we got an unexpected wow. table talk tomorrow night on good and evil and storytelling and what that means in society. I'll tomorrow. try to hop into the chat and hang out with everybody uh, for that one tomorrow night. Okay. Yeah. I would love to see you in the new chat. So it'll be good. So we'll be doing that tomorrow. So, all right, everybody. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. All right. Good night, guys.